Hello, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Is the microphone working? Great, cool. So first talk of the day, very exciting. Uh, so my name uh, is Jan Martens. Uh, I work as a DevOps engineer at Revo Digital. Uh, last year, my colleague Paul was already here and gave a talk about our journey from a shop monolith towards a microservice environment where he explained a lot about the architectural decisions that we made and how we build microservices. And today I would like to continue on the top, uh, this topic a little bit and explain to you how does this environment actually look like that we built, uh, how do we do deployments, how do we do request routing in our environment, and uh, tell you about some of the problems that we experienced once our environment got bigger and bigger and uh, how we hopefully or how we solve them uh, later on. So, does this clicker work? No, it doesn't. Does it work now? Yes. So, um, the company I work at, uh, Rewe Digital, is part of the so-called Rewe Group, which is a uh, holding that is much more than just a supermarket. So, uh, last year we had over 75 uh, billion euros in turnover. We have more than 345,000 employees in all over Europe and about or over 15,000 shops. Um, we do not only work in food retail, but we also have uh, companies that do tourism and DIY markets. So here you can see a list of all the companies that actually belong to, to the Rewe Group. So Rewe, of course, the Art Touristic, Penny Markets, Tomb DIY Markets, Bipa, Narkov, Pillar, and ITS. So actually, it's quite, quite a lot of companies that belong to, to the Rewe Group. And then there are, of course, we as Rewe Digital. We were founded in 2014 to um, tr move the digitalization of the Rewe Group forward. And we ourselves, we have offices in Cologne, here in Berlin, uh, in Ilmenau, which is in Eastern Germany, and uh, in Sofia, in Bulgaria. So what do we as uh, Rewe Digital actually run? Um, we are responsible for the Rewe online shop, the Rewe website, and the uh, food delivery service that comes with it. Um, this is our main business. Also, the mobile apps uh, are programmed by us, um, where you can also order your groceries from your mobile phone. So, uh, before we get started with our environment, I would first show you a little bit of our history, uh, which is quite interesting and also uh, responsible for some of the problems uh, we experience later on. So, as I already said, we were founded in uh, June of 2014, back at the time, we uh, took over a shop monolith that was built by an external partner. Um, and this, at the time, was running reasonably well, so people could order their stuff, it would get delivered, and uh, things were generally well, but uh, we were tasked with uh, how to actually scale this delivery service throughout Germany. So that's why we hired our first platform architect in the end of 2014, who thought about how we how we could do this, how can we sta scale this delivery service uh, throughout Germany. And the solution that we came up with it uh, with at the time was okay, let's let's do microservices. So um, we hope that by using microservices we can really scale fast and uh, deliver uh, our product quickly. Um, with microservices, uh, we introduced um, containers in uh, 2015. Um, so we decided, okay, let's let's use Docker and let's use Docker Swarm to actually deploy our microservices in our environment. Um, the first product that actually went live using only microservices was our shopping uh, app in 2016. Back at the time, there were about 20 teams involved, and uh, yeah, it was running uh, solely on our new microservices, which was very nice. And uh, at the end of 2016, we uh, were already about 30 development teams and decided, okay, um, let's split up a little bit uh, in different um, domains. So uh, we decided, okay, let's split our environment in three parts. We would split it in everything e-commerce related, so everything that uh, concerns itself with uh, ordering in the shop and so on. Then we had a fulfillment part that uh, programs everything when it comes to actually delivering your groceries to your home. And we also split up a big data part that does big 
data stuff. Um, also, um, in 2017, we then had the launch of our Revit AE marketplace, uh, as in Beta, which was super nice because we this allowed uh, external partners to also sell their products in our webshop. So, uh, if you search uh, our webshop, you can sometimes find uh, products from Butlers, for example, that uh, sell their products through our online shop, and they will get delivered by our delivery drivers as well. And uh, in the end of 2018, we launched our first food fulfillment center 2.0 in the north of Cologne, which was uh, or which is partly automated, which was a huge step forward for us because our 1.0 fulfillment centers were all manual labor, and now we have a partly automated solution, which can, uh, which actually, uh, yeah, is responsible for all the deliveries in the room of Cologne. So, uh, service-wise, this looked a little bit like this. Uh, so, as I said in the beginning, we were only one, uh, two teams with one service, and then we really, really quickly scaled up to uh, almost 50 teams in 2018, running uh, in total about 270 microservices. Um, due to this rather fast growth, we uh, were not really able to establish this some kind of DevOps culture, so we still have dedicated platform teams running the whole, thi uh, the whole thing, and uh, I work in the platform team that runs our e-commerce uh, environment. So that's what we are going to talk, or that's what I'm going to talk about today. How does this e-commerce environment look like, and how does it work? So to uh, recap a little bit, uh, we are operating a custom Docker environment consisting of all of these uh, tools. So we have Docker for containers, uh, Docker Swarm um, for actually scheduling them. We use uh, HashiCorp Console for service discovery and also Console Template uh, for configuration rendering. Uh, we rely heavily on the Elasticsearch stack. We use or we used Nginx uh, as a reverse proxy. Uh, this purplish logo down there is uh, actually the DNS mask logo. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that one before, but hey, um, we use this as well, uh, and uh, all our virtual machines or bare metal servers are running Debian. And uh, yeah, at the time, in the end of 2018, basically everything was cool. Uh, our environment worked very nice. Developers could bring code live, and everything was well, or at least we thought it was. Um, and also, yeah, the shop monolith was still running in some parts, so we didn't really g manage to get rid of this completely, but uh, we are working on it. <laughs> um, so how does the architecture of this environment look like? This is, of course, a very basic high-level overview. Um, we have dedicated ingress nodes that run uh, an Nginx, whose uh, configuration gets written dynamically by console template, and uh, they are responsible for routing external host names into our environment. So basically, uh, after a few hops, your request to Revde will end up on these ingress nodes, will, which will then um, forward them through uh, to the corresponding containers. Then we have uh, Docker dedicated Docker hosts or worker nodes um, that also run an Nginx, which is configured dynamically, um, and there we only route internal host names, um, and of course uh, they run the containers themselves. Then we have um, a set of console server or master nodes that uh, act as console masters um, and also as sorry uh, as swarm masters. So uh, from there on, we start all of our deployments. From there, everything is more or less centrally managed, and they also act as uh, DNS servers for our service discovery. So if you want to address a service, you ask the console master servers for the uh, DNS records, and it will then give you the corresponding IPs of the Docker hosts where your service might be running. And then, of course, we have some, some other managed services like Kafka, um, databases, the Elasticsearch stack, Prometheus, Grafana, and what else uh, is needed for a team to run their service properly, but uh, we will not concern ourselves with this today. 
Uh, one word about Kafka, if you're interested in that, uh, I invite you to have a look at the talk of my colleague Paul from last year. You will find it in the OSDC archive from last year, and he talked a great deal about how we do eventing with Kafka, so if this is interesting for you, please have a look. So how um, do we do deployments in our environment? Um, we do blue-green deployments, or if you don't know the name, it's also called active-inactive deployments. So a service uh, is usually deployed in two versions, uh, of which only one can ever be active. So only one of these versions will get uh, request routed to it uh, and receive all the traffic. Um, these colors get started as an independent set of containers um, per color, and in the background uh, we use Docker Compose uh, in combination with Docker Swarm to start these sets of containers per color. Um, teams can deploy themselves, so we provide them with uh, centrally managed uh, deployment jobs, uh, which they can use at, at their will to deploy at any time uh, in our environments. They can perform color switches uh, per service, so there is no global state that now green or blue is active, but they can decide for their service or for every of their services when they switch uh, the color. Um, both colors actually get the same DNS record assigned, so if I have my service running in a blue color and in green color, um, and I ask console for the DNS record, it will uh, give me the IP of all hosts where this service is running, in, in no matter which color. Um, which leads me to the next, no, it doesn't. First, we, uh, first uh, let's have a look at how this uh, deployment process work, works, and then afterwards I will talk a little bit about how the request routing works, so how can we actually differentiate where our uh, requests get routed to if we have the same DNS records for both service colors. So, um, a team typically has uh, its own Jenkins instance, which you can see on the upper left. Um, the centralized deployment toolset uh, we use is written in Ansible. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see um, consoles or the console master servers, and next to it, uh, a very simplified version of the console key value store, with where we uh, store some metadata about the service that we start. And on the bottom, you can see uh, also very simplified um, three Docker hosts that are uh, all running an Nginx instance and some service one and two, uh, one in blue and one in green every time. So if I wanted to deploy a new service, for example, a basket service that uh, handles everything basket related, um, what would I do? Uh, I will start the deployment playbook uh, and tell it, uh, give it a description of my service. So what is the name of my Docker image? What is my service name? Uh, should it be available externally? And so on and so forth. And start this playbook against uh, the console servers. They would then, as a first step, um, start an instance, or as many instances as I like, of my basket service. Um, this was rather simple, so it would, uh, Docker Swarm would simply look, okay, which Docker host has the least amount of containers running and simply start as many containers there until that this was even and only then distribute them host by host. Actually, if um, no service was, if no instance of my service was running beforehand, uh, we default to always de uh, deploy to the blue color. This is why this service gets now started in the color blue. So afterwards, as a next step, we would update the console key value store. Um, in this case, because we always deploy to the inactive color, we would, of course, write into the uh, key value store, okay, the active color for my newly deployed service should be green. Um, this will then automatically trigger a reload of uh, all of our Nginx instances. So console template um, actually watches the state of uh, the console service catalog and this console key value store, and as soon as it detects changes, it will automatically render the con uh, Nginx configuration on all hosts, not only uh, on these uh, Docker nodes, but also simultaneously on our Ingress nodes. If I'm now uh, certain that my service is running good and well, I can uh, 
start a second deployment playbook, which will simply uh, update the console key value store again and tell it, uh, set the now active caller to blue, which will then again trigger a reload of all Nginx instances. And from that point on, um, I can reach my service and all of the blue uh, instances that I just started will receive live traffic. So here it is again in all its glory, uh, the very simplified uh, deployment pipeline that we built. Um, so now, how do I actually address the service that I, uh, that I just started? So as I, as I said, um, both colors will receive the same DNS record because uh, internally they are registered as the same service in, uh, in the console uh, service uh, catalog. So if I query console for uh, the um, IP addresses of uh, my service, it will, uh, as I already said, give me all IP addresses of the service, not only uh, the host where an active instance is running. So we have to, at some point, differentiate where to route our requests. And we do this um, with the help of this Nginx instance. It is running on every worker node. Um, and we uh, there differentiate depending on the port that you used. So let's have a look at how this looks. On the left-hand side, you see me. And on the right-hand side, uh, those are the console servers again, and in the bottom, the uh, simplified Docker hosts. So if I want to reach my new basket service that I just deployed, I first ask console for the records. It will tell me, OK, here it's running on Docker host 1 and 2. And then if I um, send a request on port 80, to Docker host number one in this case, um, the Nginx will re uh, forward this request to the currently active color of my service. So everything I throw in, uh, at port 80 will always route to the active version of my um, service. So in this case, it's not running on Docker host one. This, this is why um, Nginx then forwards it to uh, the container running on Docker host two. And if I wanted for some reason to uh, reach the inactive caller, I could also do that for testing purposes, for example. And then I would just use port number 90, and Nginx will then simply route my request to the uh, green color of my service. And uh, in this case, it also uh, will always favor a locally running Docker container over a container that is running somewhere else to simply skip unnecessary uh, network hops. So here again, the whole process, uh, how it works. Um, this request routing by itself was working reasonably well. So this was actually very solid. But um, as you could or hopefully could see uh, in the beginning slides, our environment and our company grew quite a bit uh, in, in these few years. And therefore, our environment also grew quite a bit. And uh, in the beginning, this uh, request process that I just explained to you was working very well, but the bigger our environment got, the, the more problems we actually experienced with, with the way uh, we configure Nginx. Because um, we saw uh, an increasing amount of requests that actually never reached their destinations, and if we tried to uh, use Keep Alive connections towards our services, they would get dropped very, very uh, fast. And uh, this always happened during deployments of any service. Um, but in worst cases, every five seconds or so, even if there were no deployments running. Um, and the underlying reason for this was that every time, as I told you, there was a state change in the console uh, service catalog or the console key value store, console template would immediately re-render this Nginx configuration everywhere at the same time, meaning all of our Nginx instances in the environment would reload at the exact same time because Nginx uh, and the way we configured it uh, was not able to gracefully handle configuration reloads. So um, this was not so, <laughs> not so good um, because this would then actually lead uh, to in-flight requests that never reach their destinations um, to these Keep Alive connections that get dropped um, and so on. So we, we told ourselves, OK, um, how, how can we solve this? How, uh, because this was a huge problem for us. How can we, uh, what can we do? 
So we decided, okay, let's look for a different reverse proxy that is actually able to um, get configuration reloaded dynamically. And in the best case, it would also be very nice if it can be configured dynamically. So our hope was that we could maybe also get rid of console template uh, with this and uh, could simply point our, uh, re uh, what's it called, reverse proxy um, to some data store, for example, the console uh, service catalog, and it will would uh, generate routes automatically. At least that was our hope, um, what we wanted to have. So there were some alternatives that we had a look at. Um, the first thing we looked at was uh, Envoy Proxy, or Envoy, I don't know how to uh, pronounce it, uh, which you might know if you uh, have to do with Istio. Um, or Ambassador in Kubernetes, or if you had a look at Console Connect, um, these, all these products use Envoy Proxy uh, to do their uh, service routing. But for us, it quickly turned out that this was way too complex. So Envoy is a very cool product. Where you can build a lot of very fancy stuff with it, but for us, it was just too complex to set up. So um, we disregarded this one. Uh, we also had a look at Fabio LB, which or Fabio uh, LB, which is uh, a load balancer that was originally developed uh, by eBay and which can be configured dynamically from the console service catalog. So this was a very interesting candidate for us because, as I said, we wanted ideally to have our load balancer configure itself. But Fabio was missing some other features that we uh, wanted, so uh, we also skipped that and then we come to our last candidate with, uh, of course, the nicest logo of them all, uh, or not, depending if you like go first. Uh, traffic, uh, they call themselves the cloud native edge router, and um, this is actually built by design to configure it itself dynamically. So you can point traffic at a plethora of different backends, and it can. Uh, generate routes uh, all by itself. So, for example, you could point it at your local Docker API port or your console service uh, catalog. You can point it at your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, from there, it can, uh, via some meta tags that you have to provide, uh, generate routes all by itself. This is super cool. Um, and uh, it also has some nice other features that I will talk about now. So, we chose traffic. Uh, as I said, it can be dynamically configurable. Um, if you choose to not uh, configure it dynamically but use good old config files, um, it can also uh, hot reload them. So if this file changes on disk, traffic will automatically update its route and doesn't have to be reloaded, which is also a big plus. Um, it has a lot of metrics, which is super nice, um, which I will show you in a few slides. Uh, it has also a very nice web interface where you can uh, see the routes that get configured and it also runs as a single Go binary, so it is very, very easy to set up and use. So how did we go about actually uh, changing our reverse proxy uh, during live uh, traffic? Uh, what we So here again you can see the um, simplified request routing diagram um, and what we did, we would first install traffic uh, alongside Nginx on all of our Docker hosts uh, and later also on all of our Ingress nodes and would, would it first uh, have listen on a different port. So uh, for the active port, for example, we used port number 10,080 instead of port 80. This way we could really thoroughly test all the routes that traffic would generate and uh, at that point we would also see, okay, our wish to get rid of console template sadly was impossible because uh, of the uh, decision that we made to actually have both colors of a service use the same DNS record. This uh, sadly made it uh, impossible for us to use the dynamic configuration that traffic provides you with. So we still use console template there, um, but now we uh, can have the configuration reloaded dynamically. So once we were sure uh, that everything worked, we simply switch the port mapping uh, host by host. We could uh, roll this back in case of emergency, so if anything didn't work, we could simply roll back our uh, canary deployment on single hosts, fix the problem and try it again. Uh, this worked super, super nice for us. And once we were certain that everything worked and after a reasonably 
amount of time, we uh, then simply uninstalled Nginx and uh, yeah, had our reverse proxy changed. So this was uh, surprisingly simple, but uh, very effective for us. Uh, and now with traffic, uh, yeah, all of these problems that I described more or less immediately went away. So Keep Alive connections now really work, uh, which is super nice. They, the connection even holds if I redeploy the service that I'm connected to. Um, then for a short amount of time, traffic will simply respond with 404 or whatever error is uh, correct in that case, but my Keep Alive connection will always hold. It will not get dropped. This is super nice um, because internally traffic decouples the uh, listening on ports and the actual routing to the backends. Um, also, we have uh, almost real-time data about uh, the response times of our services. I will show you this in, I think, the next slide. Um, which uh, is super nice, so we built uh, very nice Grafana dashboards on top of this where we can see in almost real time how our services respond, how fast they respond, what kind of error codes we throw, how much requests we receive and so on, which is a huge plus for us because with Nginx previously we had no metrics whatsoever, so we were more or less flying blind. We didn't know how fast our services were or how many errors we threw, so this was a very nice uh, added bonus for us. Uh, and also Traffic write, writes very rich access logs in JSON format, which are super nice to parse uh, and provide you with a lot of, lot of insights. So here you can see uh, the promised Grafana dashboard. I took a screenshot uh, some days ago uh, in the evening. So you can see uh, all services are healthy, which is always nice to see. Um, you can see the accumulated response time of all our services, which updates uh, every time Prometheus scrapes uh, the traffic metrics. So at that point, it was uh, 11 milliseconds for our internal services, which I guess is quite nice. Uh, you can see the return code rate on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see the total requests by service. You can also see uh, the black sheep on the left-hand side. So the slowest one at that time took 10 seconds to respond. Um, yeah, so a lot of metrics, very nice. Uh, if you like metrics, and I guess you do, um, it's definitely worth it alone uh, for for the added metrics. Uh, here you can see uh, a screenshot of this uh, web interface that I just uh, that I talked about. So on the left hand side you can see the front ends as they are called. So um, which host header do I listen to? Uh, which uh, ports do I uh, which ports are mapped to this front end? And then to which back end does this front end uh, route its requests? And on the right hand side. You can see the actual backends with uh, a few servers, uh, the different uh, weight, and uh, some of the options that you can configure there. So um, we changed our reverse proxy, uh, got rid of those problems, um, and then we thought, oh, why? Well, let's just change another core part of our infrastructure as well, because why not? It seemed to work out just fine, and Docker Swarm uh, for us was also. Uh, a lot of pain oftentimes, so we decided, okay, uh, let's let's go ahead and also look for a different stair because uh, we also had a lot of problems that only got worse with the amount of services that were deployed in our environment. Um, because, uh, as I already mentioned a little bit, uh, the container spread of the very old do standalone Docker Swarm version that we were using was very poor, to put it nicely. Um, so we could end up with the situation that all containers of a service that was were deployed were started on the same host. And uh, it was not easy or it wasn't possible at all to do it automatically to move those containers to other hosts. Um, also, we had no self-healing uh, with this Docker Swarm concept that we built. So failed containers would get restarted, which was reasonably nice, but uh, that was about it. So if uh, if a node went down for whatever reason, um, Docker Swarm would not start all containers that run on this node somewhere else. The, they were simply lost and we had to cope with this somehow. So this was a huge problem and also uh, there was no way for us to automatically drain a node if we had to take it down for maintenance reasons, for example. So we had to come up with a very tedious manual process to actually rescale every container that was running on that host somewhere else 
uh, in the hope that it would work uh, before we could take this note down. So this was a huge pain for us, and we decided, okay, why not switch it as well? Um, and there we looked for a different orchestrator that could provide us with proper self-feeding, so for example, in case of a node outage, it would be nice, and uh, we wanted to be able to ensure a proper container spread. So what uh, were the options on the table? Of course, um, we could also always use um, the now integrated swarm mode that comes with Docker, but we were kind of hesitant to do that because our experience with the standalone swarm wasn't that nice, and we decided, okay, let's just not do that. Uh, then there was, of course, the, the Kubernetes option um, to run it by yourself or to use a managed uh, uh, yeah, provider like Rancher for this, but it turned out that uh, this was a way to a huge step for us, so we needed to change a lot in our environment to make this work. And um, seeing that we ideally wanted to make this switch of our container orchestrator completely uh, transparent, not only to our customers, but also to our developers as well, uh, we said, okay, no, let's not do uh, Kubernetes. And that's why uh, we decided we take a look at HashiCorp Nomad. Um, HashiCorp Nomad uh, is, uh, as the name might suggest, uh, developed by the same company that already uh, developed uh, Console, which we rely on heavily. It has a seamless uh, console integration, which is super nice. Um, so you can basically uh, start your Nomad uh, program and tell it, here is your console server, please connect there, and uh, then it almost works instantly. You don't have to do a lot of uh, setting up. Um, this worked almost out of the box without uh, a lot of configuration. This was super nice. It actually has proper self-healing. We thoroughly tested it, so we could shoot down a node and it would immediately start up these containers everywhere else as we hoped it would. Um, it has bin packing enabled by default, so uh, contrary to the old Docker Swarm, um, if you uh, yeah, do not uh, ensure that your containers are spread everywhere, it will try to uh, utilize the resources of your machines to the maximum. Uh, which is especially nice if you are operating in a cloud environment where every megahertz costs more or less. Uh, it is again a single Go binary, which was very easy to set up, and it also has a very nice web interface where you can see the history of your jobs that you start with Nomad. You can see uh, what might have been reason why your containers crashed. You can see logs directly in the web interface and so on. So this is again uh, a very nice uh, added benefit. How did we go on to um, change this in live traffic. Uh, so it, this process was pretty similar to the way we, we changed the reverse proxy in the first place. So we, due to the fact that we had this centrally managed Ansible playbooks that developers had to or have to use when deploying a service, uh, we simply changed these playbooks at some point to say, okay, if I now want to redeploy a service, sorry, uh, if I want to redeploy uh, my basket service, it will first stop the old version running in Docker Swarm and then start a new version running in Nomad. I hope you can see the difference uh, with the different shape and the greenish color. Uh, this shall indicate that this is now a container started in Docker Swarm. Um, yeah, and that was basically it. So um, the coo very cool thing was that um, you can run Docker Swarm and Nomad alongside on, on a Docker host. And uh, Nomad doesn't really care about any workload that it doesn't start itself. So you can gradually move stuff over from Swarm to Nomad, and Nomad will only care about everything uh, that it started itself, so they wouldn't get into each other's way, which was super nice. And then at some point, uh, after about, I think it took us three weeks in our production environment to get all teams uh, to redeploy their service. Uh, there we had the situation that every container was started with Nomad and we could uh, then stop the old Docker Swarm and uh, be done with, uh, with this migration as well. So as you can see again, not rocket science, but uh, yeah, it uh, worked very well for us in the long run. Uh, we are very, very happy with, um, with the way Nomad works. 
Um, of course, there are also some benefits. So we can, in the job definition files of Nomad, ensure a proper container spread. So uh, actually, uh, we can we can tell Nomad, okay, uh, please deploy all of my how many instances uh, I want to start on different hosts. And if it cannot do that, this uh, it will fail the deployment. This is super nice. Uh, it has self-healing uh, in case of outage, as I already mentioned. We now have uh, uh, nice access control lists, so we can limit the access to uh, who can start containers and who cannot. Uh, you can inspect the job history in the web interface, and again, it has a lot of uh, metrics that you can use, as you will see uh, in the next few slides. Also, you are not limited to Docker with Nomad. Um, I don't know about your relationship with Docker, but um, for us, it's sometimes love and hate. Uh, so um, <laughs> it doesn't always work the way that we want it to. And uh, Nomad actually has first class support for running your workloads with Rocket or with LXCE. And if you want, you are not even limited to containers with Nomad. So it also provides a way for you to simply deploy jar files or simply execute binaries and it can also if you want uh, schedule virtual machines for you so those are very interesting features that we are actually looking into um, if we maybe change something there uh, so very interesting and with this again you don't have to do have to change anything if you want to use this okay of course you would have to install rocket for example on your host but uh, you simply change a line in your job definition, and that's it. And Nomad starts the container with Rocket and not with Docker. So this is super nice uh, and very promising uh, alternative. So uh, here you can see the uh, web interface of Nomad. Uh, as I already told you, you can see a lot of details. So how many ta uh, containers are still queued, how many are currently starting up, how many are running. You can see logs. You can see resources used and so on. Uh, which is uh, very nice not only for us but also for uh, our developers so they can see what how their service behaves, uh, what resources they are, it is using and uh, access the logs directly in a web interface. Uh, again, it has a lot of metrics so we, uh, we kind of like building Grafana dashboards so we also built one for Nomad uh, which shows you in this case for example the amount of running containers, uh, the used CPU for all your allocations, the used memory, you can see the allocated and vice ver versus the used memory of your host. So I'm, I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, but the, the red bar on the left hand side is the allocated memory and this yellow line, which is about 50% of it, is the actually used memory. So there's a lot to improve there, um, but it's definitely nice to uh, be able to see something like this. And also, uh, we built our own um, like service overview service for our developers, where they can uh, have a look at uh, everything that uh, they need for their service. And here, with uh, with the help of these metrics, we now also have uh, the real time or almost real time uh, display of the resource usage. Uh, we during the the actual migration, we could show uh, which orchestrator was currently active for a given color. So we could have uh, the situation that, for example, the blue color in the top was still running Swarm. Then you would see a Swarm logo there next to the inactive uh, bar. And on the bottom, you would uh, already have Nomad running, for example. And you could see this directly in the web interface, which helped not only us a lot to see about the status of the migration, but also our developers to, yeah, to see how it's going, how their service is behaving. Uh, also with direct links to access logs uh, in the Elasticsearch stack, for example, and uh, a list of the service events generated by Nomad. So that's it. Um, what did we learn in, in all of this um, process? Um, what helps you a lot definitely is to have centralized deployment tool sets or playbooks or whatever, because with this, we could perform a simple change and can could be sure that the next deployment that was started as soon as we merged the change would actually use it directly. This was super helpful for us, and this was the main reason why we 
could actually migrate in, in an amount of three weeks in our production environment from Swarm to Nomad with, without any real work that had to be done by the teams. Uh, all they had to do was uh, to come up with a memory limit for their service because uh, in uh, difference to the Swarm that we were using, Nomad uh, en uh, enforces a service memory limit. Um, but that was about everything the teams had to do. So we had to bring them to change a simple value in their service description and then redeploy. This was very, very nice uh, for us. And also what helped a lot was to do these canary-like um, changes uh, in, our in our environment. So to really make sure that this change can always be rolled back without a lot of work. Um, so we actually had some issues with it in, in the uh, actual process and then we could simply roll back and everything was fine. This helped us a lot. So, and uh, what do you learn? Please, please don't hate me, uh, but you might not need uh, Kubernetes. Uh, it might, might be uh, enough to, to look for a simpler alternative that uh, works well enough for you. So uh, this is definitely one, one big point that we took away from it. You don't really need to use Kubernetes if you don't want to. Uh, there are other alternatives out there. Um, try to keep your, your architecture pluggable. This helps you a lot in the long run. So try not to yeah, intervene. Is this the right word? I don't know. Uh, try to keep things as separated as possible. So in, in the long run, you can change uh, a component if you have issues with it. Um, so I think the, the only thing that we definitely cannot change is uh, using console as a service discovery tool because we use it everywhere. But I think pretty much everything else we, we can, with reasonable effort, um, change uh, during uh, our live uh, traffic. So this helps you a lot. Um, it can be difficult to, to care about um, memory limits all of a sudden, and you can uh, <laughs> suddenly find out that your resources are in, in fact finite. Um, and then you have to run around uh, to all teams and tell them, hey, uh, why is your Docker container using eight gigabytes of RAM? Can you please lower it because now uh, no one else can deploy? Um, so this was this was funny at some points and uh, can surprise you if you uh, didn't have to deal with it uh, beforehand. And uh, also one one thing that we learned the hard way is uh, distributed systems can be very hard and don't fiddle with the cluster state of your distributed system. Um, we actually managed to completely shoot down one of our development environments uh, when we had the idea that, hey, let's <laughs> let's change the cluster state uh, on the on the uh, hard drive. What what can happen? Yeah, yeah, a lot <laughs> apparently. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that are our learnings, and uh, that's it. Uh, thanks goes to my team, Team Acme, with the greatest logo of them all. And uh, thank you a lot for your attention. I hope you found this interesting. If you have any questions, please ask. I will answer them gladly. <laughs> Do we have bad experiences with Kubernetes? Yeah, we actually we, we tried uh, using it instead of Nomad um, for about a week. We would try to get a proof of concept working, and it just wouldn't work without a reasonable effort. That's why we we decided against it. Hello. Hey. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I just had a question. Yeah. Um, you talked a, a bunch about console. Yeah. And it, it seemed that you actually use that to build other stuff, and you depend on it. Yeah. I'm actually curious about how you set up and manage over time console itself. Mm -hmm. If you have any tricks, or if you have a script, or how you actually yeah, do the uh, config management for it. Yeah, we we use Ansible for for our config management, and um, basically all all the playbooks that we use uh, include a console task. So, for example, if I install uh, the Elasticsearch stack. Uh, there's a task that it uh, creates a it installs console as a client on on the host and will uh, register uh, the Elasticsearch service in console by itself. And um, the registering of services uh, into console 
uh, we, with Swarm, we, we did this with a, a third-party tool that is called Registrator. Um, so this is a simple Docker container that uh, you have to map your Docker socket to, and then uh, it inspects the environment variables of all your <coughs> containers that are started. And depending on a, a given set of variables that you put into your environment uh, variables, uh, it will then uh, register this container as a service in console. And uh, with uh, Nomad, uh, we could simply uh, define this in the job file itself. So because Nomad has this first class uh, support for console, you can simply tell in your job definition, please register my container or my job as a console service under this port, and that's, uh, then it's done. of uh, distributed data centers mm -hmm. uh, is uh, something similar existing in uh, Nomad as well. Yeah. So that you can also somehow define like, okay, this um, container needs to be running five times per data yeah. center yeah. or something. You can actually define quotas per data center, for example. You can say, okay, 30% in this data center, the 70 in the rest or uh, whatever you want. You can also uh, define limits on, for example, the CPU type, the kernel version, uh, and so on. There's a, a lot that you can configure and also uh, depending on the data center as so well. Is it um, also, um, what I want to say, uh, I'm going to think about that <laughs> question later. Kay. I'm going to ask yeah, you that. Bother me later. <laughs> Hi. Do we have any PCI-related services on the same cluster? Please. So with uh, payments? Uh, yeah. Because of thinking of the PCI requirements you have. And we have at the moment just normal virtual house because it is a requirement. Mm -hmm. And we are asking us if it is also possible to have the PCI requirements in uh, Docker-like things. Yeah, we, we do have payment processing services as well running in there, if this uh, answers your question. I'm not really sure. Yeah, it'll, it'll <laughs> so yeah, we, we do payments as well with microservices. Any more questions? Um, hi. Regarding the um, DNS issues that you have, that you have the name DNS name for every service uh, for blue and green, mm -hmm. did you try to work with text with that stuff to separate it? Um, so uh, we, uh, in, in console itself, we, we separate them with text. Um, so I, I don't know if all of you know console, but if you register a container in the console uh, service discovery, you can give it a set of tags uh, that you can differentiate with it. So every con con uh, container that is started in the uh, green color gets a green tag uh, with uh, its service definition and all blue containers get a blue tag. And based on this tag, we then generate the different routes. And of course, you could also um, do lookups <coughs> based on this tag. This is a super nice feature of console. You can prefix the tag or any tag you give um, your container uh, your your service instances, and it will then only uh, console will then only give you all the hosts where the service with this uh, tag is running. So we definitely looked into this, but um, we couldn't really figure out how to create active and inactive tags um, without um, basically more or less redeploying on uh, color change. And this was something we didn't want to do because. The way we currently do this by just simply switching a value in the console key value store, we have an atomic change that triggers uh, a configuration reload everywhere. And uh, we couldn't get this working with uh, trying to use active and inactive tags. Yep. Um, do you have the need for persistent data in your cluster, or is everything stateless? So far? Um, everything is stateless. Um, if a service needs to store data, it um, has its own uh, Postgres database usually, um, and also uh, if it has data that it, is, it shares with uh, different services, it produces them on a Kafka topic. If this interests you, I can again uh, recommend the talk of Paul from last year, 
where he talks about this same uh, exact problem. So how do we share data between stateless microservices? Any more questions? Okay. No, cool. then thank you again, Jan. Yeah, thank you a lot.